Good morning, everybody. It's good to have you here at the New Covenant. Those of you online, we welcome you as well. I've got a couple of things that I'd like to mention to you. Before we get into worship, next Sunday we have a business meeting, uh, and uh, the primary issue that we have there is there's a local pastor who has a small congregation. They are losing their place of their location to meet, and they've asked if we could give them some space to meet on Sunday afternoon and Tuesday evening. So that's what we'll be talking about. The pastor was here last week. You may have, uh, you may have seen him or met him. What I need you guys to do is to think this coming week about the idea of letting another church meet here. We have decent facilities and so forth, but they're not going to be here when we are. So I want you to think about that. We just bought some new sound equipment. There's some things like that, some issues that we may need to think about. So I want you to spend some time thinking and praying about that ahead of time so that this coming Sunday we can talk about it at the business meeting. Um, as far as I know, this is a, a Christian church. It's a Pentecostal church. Uh, the man, the pastor seems to be a good man. He just needs a place to meet. And he has asked if we could do it. And I said, I don't have a problem with it. But uh, we need everybody together uh, to think about that and talk about that. So we'll look into that next week, okay? If you have any questions about it during the week, give me a call. I'll tell you what I know. And we can discuss it any further, okay? So that's coming up next week. This coming Saturday, the ladies group is meeting. So ladies, be aware of that. And with that, let us bring ourselves before the Lord. Is that your stomach? <laughs> oh. Elevator. Elevator. <laughs> Psalm 84, one of my favorites. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrows find a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. Imagine that. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, and whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O oh Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O oh God of Jacob. Just think of that. Behold our shield, O oh God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Pray with me, please. This morning, Heavenly Father, may you be found welcome here among us. May we with your churches around the world honor you with what we do. May our worship be with clean hands and pure hearts. And may you receive it with joy. We ask your blessing on our time here, Lord, that you would be glorified. In the strong name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Please stand and let's worship together.
how to pray, I'm going to read from our Who's Your One prayer book. Hopefully you are following along each day and praying for your lost uh, friends. So I'm going to go to day seven, uh, since this is August 7th, and I'm going to use that just so you know. Please be seated, and let's come before the Lord. Heavenly Father, I say let's come before the Lord as if this is different from what we just did. Well, that's not true, is it? For most of us, we've already presented ourselves before you to worship you and to honor you. So now we're presenting ourselves in a little bit of a different way, through verbal prayer like this. We thank you that you are exalted. And we recognize, Lord, you're not exalted because we say so. You are supreme in the universe. There's none like you. So you are exalted whether we say so or not, but we proclaim the truth that you are above all. Lord Jesus, your name is the great name above all other names. There is no name like it on heaven, on earth, or underneath the earth. We bless you for your majesty. We thank you for your graciousness. We thank you, Lord, for your justice. We thank you that you have promised to punish sin. And for those of us that trust in Jesus as our Savior, those of us who are committed to following Jesus in this life, our sins are already taken care of on the cross, and we praise you for that. But, oh, Lord, we pray for those around us who may not know you. Some think they do. Some are aware they don't. Some just aren't sure. Oh, we lift these people to you, Lord. We ask you to save these folks. Many of them have heard the gospel, some of them numerous times. They know the truth. Please bring them back into the light to know you as Savior and Lord. Father, your opponents can only know you when they experience true repentance. I know that most people don't consider themselves opponents or even enemies of God, but that's exactly what they are. Your word tells us that. They're held captive by Satan to do his will rather than yours. Our lost friends, our loved ones, are classic examples of this reality, Lord. They will only recognize that captivity when they repent of their sins. Please cause these people to see their sin for what it is, rebellion against their creator and disobedience to your perfect law. Grant them true repentance, not just sorrow for sin's consequences, and cause them, Lord, to admit their sin and turn from it toward you. Please be pleased to use us in bringing these people to you. But Lord, if we are more in the way than helpful, then remove us and bring somebody else in their lives who can share the gospel more effectively or has a better testimony or just can do the job in a different way. We ask you, Lord, to save these folks. Give each one of us at least one person to focus on, to pray for. For Lord, your kingdom is not just about the saved, the recently saved, or those to be saved. Those of us who have already committed our lives to you, Lord, we need your grace every day. You have given us faith to believe and grace to repent. We thank you for that. But now, Lord, we need to get through today. So please strengthen us. Teach us to be patient and loving and godly. The fruit of the Spirit, Lord, needs to dwell in each of us. Love, and joy, and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Remind us, Lord, that these are evidences of the Spirit working in our lives. So let those shine forth in our lives to others. We pray for those who can't be with us here. We ask you to take care of them, whether they're sick concerned about virus or traveling, we pray that you protect them, Lord, and bring them back to us safely. We ask you to remind us, Lord, that we can't make it through this life on our own. We need a Savior. We need someone who will take us through the oceans that overwhelm us and cause us to be hopeless and depressed. You are the one who lifts us out of the miry clay, out of the depths, out of the ocean. You are the one who gives us hope in Jesus Christ. To you be the glory, Lord, we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Please stand, and let's not begin to worship, let's continue. <laughs>
because, Lord Jesus, you lived a perfect life, because you died on the cross and paid for our sins, because you rose from the dead and ascended to the Father, because one day you will return and rescue us and set all things right, we honor you. For those who don't know you, may they understand a little bit of what they're missing. And may we live as those who appreciate what you've done, that we may point people to you. In the glorious name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Kids, you can go to Children's Church. My text today is in Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have a Bible, please open to Isaiah 6. We are in this emphasis called Who's Your One? The idea of focusing on at least one person who can, um, who we can pray for and serve and uh, hopefully lead to the Lord or be part of that person coming to the Lord. It has occurred to me that an emphasis on outreach is certainly appropriate for a church, but we don't want to get the cart before the horse. We need to have priorities. We need to do things in the right order. There's a preacher named Haddon Robinson, and he, he uh, wrote a book on preaching, and, and he was pointing out the recipe for rabbit stew. Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have ever had rabbit stew? <laughs> How many of you liked it? Yeah. Let me read you the recipe for rabbit stew. First, catch the rabbit. And that's really as far as we need to go today. If you don't have the rabbit, you got no stew. So I want to make sure that we catch our rabbit before we worry about stewing anything. Today, as we pray for our lost friends and relatives, I'm going to ask each one of us to come together as a body, to seek God, I'm going to say in a special way, I want us to make sure our hands are clean, our heart is right before the Lord. Imagine the arrogance of myself or anyone else asking the Lord to bring lost people here if his people, if God's people, are not ready to receive them and ready to worship him as he is intended to. Now, by the grace of God, your hearts are right before the Lord. Uh, I hope that's true, that you've been worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth this morning. But today I want to take some extra time. I even thought about uh, doing the Lord's Supper uh, to help with us in this, but I don't think that'll be necessary. I'm going to call each one of us to consecrate himself to serve the Lord once again. If you have not committed yourself to Christ... This will be the day that you can consider the gates of heaven are open to you. We want to make sure that we belong to the Lord and that what we're doing is not just the right thing, but in the right way, with the right attitudes. So I'm going to try to lead us this morning in a cleansing of ourselves, maybe into those dark areas that we haven't ventured into for a while. Maybe you think about those people that need to be forgiven or ought to forgive us. Maybe in the area where we thought we should have said something, but we didn't. We were afraid or embarrassed or whatever. Maybe into an area of the, just the thought life that no one else can see. It's hidden, and yet we hold on to it. And the Lord just doesn't like that part of our life. Let's start with the Lord. I'm going to read in Isaiah 6. I invite you to stand with me in honor of the Word of God if you're able to do that. In Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1, we have the vision of Isaiah that helps us understand his ministry. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, 
holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I. Send me. Isaiah's vision of the Lord brought him face to face with his own sinfulness. But as Isaiah responded to that in repentance, the Lord healed him and sent him forth as a worker for the kingdom. That, folks, is what we'll look at today. And hopefully, by the grace of God, we will be better prepared today to serve the Lord. Pray with me, please. Lord, will you then withhold your blessing from us? Will you allow us to see you in your majesty? Will you give us the honor of participating with you in your work? If your spirit does not move in us this morning, it shall not happen. So we ask for that. In the name of our risen Savior, Jesus, amen. Please be seated. We can get caught up in priorities or lack of priorities. We get stuck on one thing and not another. If you have some people, some friends who aren't in church today, it's very likely they have something else to do. And you think, well, what could be more important than going to church? Well, you know, you get things to do. Sometimes the moment overwhelms us. I heard the story of uh, some guys that went deer hunting. Mm-hmm, deer hunting. They went off and they paired off in twos to go hunting during the day and then come back to the camp at night bringing their, their deer kill with them. Uh, one evening all the gang had, had gotten back to the camp except one guy, this one pair. And they were wondering where Bill and Harry were. Bill and Harry were not to be heard from. They didn't have their cell phones. They were old time guys, right? And then they heard something coming from the woods and they see there's Harry right there. And he's dragging an eight point buck. Ladies, that's a big deer. Okay, so he's dragging his eight-point buck like this, pulling it through the grass. And they said, man, what a deer, that's great. Uh, where's, where's Bill? Oh, man, Bill had a stroke. He's way up there in the woods. I don't know how he's doing. Well, why didn't you bring Bill? Because I knew no one would steal his body. Okay, it's priorities. We have to keep our priorities in line. Before we worry about the deer or the rabbit stew, this is kind of a, a wildlife Sunday, isn't it? We need to make sure that we have our priorities right. And before we go looking to lead somebody else to the Lord, we need to make sure that we are right before Christ. And that's our intention, hopefully every day, certainly every Sunday when we gather. But I want us to take an extra step this morning. Let's consider Isaiah's vision. In the first three verses, we have the vision of Isaiah seeing the Lord. Um, it says in verse 1, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Now, it does say that Isaiah was in deep prayer. It doesn't say he was having his quiet time or was preaching or something like that. But as you read Isaiah's record here, his, his prophecy, you find that he was a man of God. He walked with God. He was able to see this vision because the Lord was already with him. And that's the first thing I want us to note. We've got to make sure that we spend time with the Lord. Now, you've heard me say that over and over again. We've got to spend time in the Word every day. We need to pray every day. I'm asking you to pray every day this month 
for a friend, at least one person. These things bring us in touch with the Lord. They get us in tune with who he is and what he's doing. To ignore this is to ignore our very health, spiritually speaking. You cannot be what the Lord wants you to be if you're not spending regular time in the word and prayer. It can't happen. That's why he's given us his word. I'm not going to dwell on that anymore because I've, I've dealt with that quite a bit in the past. I do want you just to, to realize that Isaiah had this vision in the context of his walk with the Lord. And he saw the Lord glorious and lifted up high above all others. And, and he was just overwhelmed with the presence of the Lord. I got to tell you, that doesn't happen a whole lot in my life. Uh, when I pray to the Lord, I, I hope I'm sincere and I'm talking with the Lord. I hope I'm on the right page with him. But I don't fall out and, 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 and get lost in that sort of stuff. I'm just talking with the Lord. But what we need is a vision, an understanding of his magnificence. And then maybe our prayers will change. If we can see his glory, if we can appreciate the majesty that is the Lord who died for our sins and rose from the dead on his own, then maybe we can understand a little bit more about him and what he desires from us. There's a couple of passages that have meant a whole lot to me in Scripture that I draw upon when I just need to praise the Lord. You might want to write these down. I don't know. These, were, these have been great for me. One of them comes from David. One of them comes from Jeremiah. These are passages that you could do a whole lot worse than to spend time with. 1 Chronicles 29 not 1 Corinthians, it's 1 Chronicles 29, 11 through 13. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth. Yours is the dominion, O Lord, and you rule over all. And it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. Now, therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. This was David at his best, dedicating the materials that were going to be used to build the temple. Sometimes I, I don't know what to say. I just say, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Try that sometime. And just let the word of God come out and praise him with his own word. Psalms are really good for that. David wrote a lot of those. We're going to look at some of those in a minute. Another passage that I use for praise is in Jeremiah chapter 10. Now this one may not be familiar to you. I stumbled on it when I was having a quiet time going through Jeremiah. Jeremiah has 52 chapters. They're not all chronological. So it was uh, a little difficult getting through it, but I stumbled upon a bunch of great verses in Jeremiah. And this passage is one of them. Jeremiah 10, verses 6 and 7 and 10. Verses 6, 7, and 10. I use this in my prayer life. There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and great is your name and might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? Indeed, it is your due. For among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is no one like you. But the Lord is the living God. He's the true God and the everlasting King. At his wrath, the earth quakes and the nations cannot endure his indignation. Folks, I'm not trying to be dramatic. This is not a Shakespearean play. When I pray these things, it's with my heart. Try that. Get some passages. Get a psalm or one of these passages from 1 Chronicles 11 or Jeremiah 10 or someplace like that. And just let the Spirit lead you. Not asking for anything. You've got your prayer list. Good. Set it aside for a minute. But just talk with Jesus. Listen to him. Let him put his arms around you and remind you that you are important to him. You're important enough that he would die for you. In the Psalms, every once in a while, as we're reading here, we come to a little word, Selah, S-E-L-A-H. It was in Psalm 84 twice this morning that I was reading 
That word is translated generally, think of this or imagine that. The idea is to pause for a moment and just think of that. Jesus died for your sins. Silah. Think of that. Jesus rose from the dead. Silah. Think of that. Jesus is coming again. Oh yes. Imagine that. Get a grasp on the majesty of your Savior and Redeemer first before you try to tell somebody else about him. Look at the response of the, of the vision. Verse 5, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the Lord, the King, the God of hosts, the Lord of hosts. Typically, okay, I can't speak for everybody, but I've known myself, sometimes when I pray, I just barge right into the throne. And, Yo, Lord, listen, I need some help right now, you know? Or, oh, Lord, I'm getting ready to go to sleep. Uh, let's see, I want to pray for the fam, I want to pray for the church. Pray for the country, goodness gracious. Terry would appreciate that. But there's not a sense of, of humbleness and, and the Lord's majesty coming into his presence. But that's just what Isaiah had. When that vision hit, verse 4 says, the foundations of the threshold shook as the voice of him who called, at the voice of him who called. The house was filled with smoke. If a house is filled with smoke, you don't stick around, you run out. But not Isaiah. He was struck with his own sinfulness before the Lord. And that's what ought to happen when we come in the presence of purity. Remember Peter in Luke chapter 5? The Lord Jesus was preaching. He went out in Peter's boat. He said, all right, gang, drop the nets down. They said, we can't. We've been fishing all night. Jesus said, one more time. He said, all right. They pulled up the net. There were hundreds of fish in there. Peter looked at Jesus. He jumped on the shore. He fell down at his feet and he said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When you recognize the majesty of the Lord, we can't remain the same. Peter couldn't go anywhere. He was on the edge of a lake. So he wanted Jesus to go somewhere. Isaiah couldn't remain the same. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. I am done for. I'm a sinful person. All my family, all my country is sinful. I have sinful lips. I can't speak the truth. What shall I do? And that ought to be our attitude as we come before the Lord. Jesus died for your sins. Selah. Think of that. Oh. The things that I have allowed to come into my mind. The things that I have done. And the Lord's hanging on the cross saying, again? And I'm saying, Lord, if you'll suffer, if you'll suffer just a little bit longer and let me sin, I'll say I'm sorry. But that's not what you do when you're in the presence of the majesty. You drop what you're doing. You stop what you're doing. You beg for relief from the glory that's coming from the throne. Look what happened. Verse 6, it says, one of the seraphim, a seraphim, seraphim is plural of seraph. A seraph is an angel. There are several kinds of angels in scripture. This is the only place in, in the whole Bible that a seraph is mentioned. There are seraphim hanging around the throne of God. We know of cherubim, cherubs. We know of archangels and angels and others. Paul refers to authorities and, and kingdoms and things like that that probably refer to angels. But this is the only place we have a seraph that's mentioned. It says, One of the seraphim came to me, having in his hand a burning coal he had taken with tongs from the fire. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Now, as I was meditating on this passage and thinking about it, 
a thought came to mind. Why did the seraph pull the coal out of the fire with tongs? Once he pulled it out of the fire, he took it in his hand. It's not like he's got a flesh hand that will be seared and burned. He's an angel. He can do burning coals. But why did he pull it out with tongs? Scripture doesn't tell us. This is my guess. No one can get that close to the purity of God. He is different from all of his creation. The angel couldn't reach the coals. They represented the Lord's purity and, and cleansing. So he took some tongs and reached up and grabbed them. What would have happened if he had tried to reach it with his hand? I don't know. It's just interesting to me that he used tongs. And that Isaiah noticed that. The guy used tongs. And then he grabbed the coal in his hand. What, had it cooled down by then? I don't think so. It wasn't that he couldn't hold it. It was that the Lord's majesty was so overwhelming. The angel who lives with God daily couldn't get that close to him. Jesus is a God of majesty. Silah. Think of that. And yet we go into his presence as if he's just somebody else. And we just want to talk and shoot the breeze. Oh, church, let us see the majesty on high. Let us recognize yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and the earth. So what happened? Isaiah recognized his own sinfulness. The seraph brought the coal and he touched Isaiah's lips. He had specifically, Isaiah specifically said, I'm a man of sinful lips. That's what was healed. The coal went right to his lips, and he was healed. Now his sins were atoned for. Now he could rise and stand in the presence of the Lord. When the Lord shows up, I have no doubt, we will fall to our, our, our faces in, in, in honor and probably terror, a holy fear certainly, but to his people the Lord will say, Arise and reign with me, and we will rise up, and we will see him as he is, and everything will be okay. My wife, Rhoda, <laughs> you know her. Rhoda was, uh, she tells a story of one time she got separated from her parents in the store. Uh, parents, isn't that the worst nightmare? One of the worst nightmares. Uh, one of my kids did that. He even hid in a clothing rack until we could finally find him. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but it was one of my kids. And we're just going crazy. Where is the kid? Where is the kid? And it was so much fun for that kid for him just to stay there in the clothes hidden, you know, we couldn't find him. Well, Rhoda went through that very thing. And, but it wasn't on purpose, it wasn't intentional. She was, she just uh, was busy doing her little girl thing and her parents went off in another direction and she missed him and she looked around and, and she couldn't find him anywhere and she got terrified and she started crying and a lady came up to kind of help. She said, well, I'm looking for my mom and dad. They don't have me with them and they're about this tall and I don't know what to do. So the, the, the worker took her to the service desk and sent out a, a loudspeaker call. Um, your little girl is here at the service desk. And Rhoda said she's sitting there just trembling and she looks up and there's her daddy coming down the aisle. And he ain't walking. He's running. Daddy's coming. And everything is okay. When Jesus returns, that's what it will be like. Let us honor him today in the midst of not okay, knowing that one day it will be okay and everything will be right. Isaiah had that sensation just then. His sins were atoned for. And he turned from whatever happened, he turned from his wicked ways. And the Lord allowed him to be in his presence. Gang, that's what we need. We need the Lord to heal us, to atone for our sins, to cleanse us. Isaiah said in verse 5, I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What we need, gang, is to be clean. We need to be clean before the Lord. If you have given your life to Jesus Christ, you have repented of your sins and you're following him, your sins have been atoned for. You are good. If you haven't yet, you need to know you're in danger of going to hell. 
But even if you are, belong to Christ right now, we still drop the ball day by day, don't we? We still need to get things right. We still have wrong thoughts. We say things we shouldn't say. We envy something or we're greedy for this or we're uh, lazy for this or whatever. There's all kinds of sins that we commit even as Christians. We need to be clean. One of the reasons we need to be clean is because it displeases the Lord when we're not. The second reason is the world is watching us. I've asked you, who is your one? Well, your one is probably watching you. Your one probably realizes you seem to be a good person. You may claim to be a Christian, but yeah, that one day you lost it at work. Yeah, I remember that. Or that one day in the family outing, you just, you just blew up and it was embarrassing to everybody. I remember that sort of stuff. We've got to be clean. We need to make sure we clean things up from the past, that our hands are clean and right for the Lord. I was interested in this word clean. I looked it up. The words for clean that are used in Scripture. In the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the word clean is sometimes translated purify or select or choose or to make something bright or shining, to make something free or exempt from something. It's translated at the word clean itself 80 times. In the Old Testament, this is a big deal. Um, in the Old Testament, ceremonies, sacrifices were given to make people clean. Animals could be clean, houses could be clean, clothing could be made clean, people could be made clean. But you had to do it the right way. You had to offer the right sacrifice. King David had cleanliness on his mind. We read about him from 1 Chronicles 29. Listen to some of the psalms that he wrote and the emphasis he puts on being clean before God. In Psalm 19, he says, the fear of the Lord is clean. Now, the fear of the Lord is necessary for wisdom and for knowing God, but it's clean? Yeah, it's pure. It purifies us. In Psalm 24, the question is asked, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? And David answers, he who has clean hands and a pure heart must have the clean hands. And in Psalm 51, we have David lamenting after he has sinned colossally with Bathsheba. And he has felt his sin just as Isaiah felt his sin in chapter 6 of Isaiah. And David said in, Isaiah, in Psalm 51, Purge me with, with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That was his desire. But it's not just an Old Testament idea. Do you remember in the New Testament, in Matthew 23, Jesus was yelling at the Pharisees. He said, you guys worry about cleaning the, the dishes and so forth. You clean the inside of the dish and you don't have to worry about cleaning the outside. Well, he was talking about specific things, but he was also speaking symbolically. Clean the inside first, and then the outside will be clean. He said later in John 15, 3, you are clean because of the word that I spoke to you. The word of God cleanses us. That's one reason we need to be exposed to it so regularly. It cleanses us. It convicts us of sin. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 7.1, Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So we are called to cleanse ourselves, do what we can do to make our, ourselves right before God. Cleansing is his work. But we are to do what we can in that process. And James, uh, chapter 4, verse 8, famously says, and uh, John preached on this a while back, Cleanse your, your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We need to be clean. I want us to be clean. Someone uh, wrote, I read this week, that the idea of consecration of consecrating or cleaning ourselves for the Lord's work is the same idea as repairing wiring, to repair the wires. The wires are there. You flip the switch, the light ought to come on. But if it doesn't, it's either a problem with the light bulb or it's the wires. Let's assume it's with the wires. So you go in and you fix the wires. The switch still works. The light still works because the wire is repaired. Gang, we have wires that have been kinked. 
They've been messed up. In some places, the sin of mice uh, or, or, or whatever has come in and, and eaten up some of our wires. We need to repair these wires. We need to make sure our hands and our hearts are right with God. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to read Psalm 51. And you are welcome to follow along in it with me if you want. This was a psalm that I read one verse of a few minutes ago that David composed in the power of the Holy Spirit, voicing his repentance after his sin with Bathsheba. I'm going to read it as as coming from my own heart. You're welcome to read along with me, probably not out loud, but if you want to out loud, that's okay. We may have different versions. I'm going to read from the ESV version, but what I want you to do is pray this along with me. I want you to see that the call here is to be clean, to be contrite before God, to have whatever is in the way of us and God removed. Maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's something that the Lord just brought to mind that you did years ago and you still feel embarrassed about. You never asked the Lord's forgiveness. Maybe it's an attitude towards your boss or a family member. Or maybe it's your, uh, a, a pet sin or a pet peeve that, that we have. Maybe it's a particular vulnerability in one area. Maybe it's, it's food or it's anger or worry or pornography or the occasional four-letter word. Whatever still has a hold on you, bring before the Lord now. <clears throat> Let him cleanse you. And if you have not given your heart to the Lord yet, understand this is the time to do that. Let Psalm 51 be your prayer of dedication, asking the Lord to heal you and save you. We are in the presence of the Lord. Silah. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Oh, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Oh, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Ah, oh, cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold with me, uphold me with a willing spirit. Then, then I will teach transgressions your way and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing, uh, sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. 
do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, and then you will delight in right sacrifices. And burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Continue praying with me, please. The words that you gave David, Heavenly Father, are our words. Pray that our attitude would be his. As you have convicted us by your spirit of sin and righteousness and judgment, let us turn from those things and be yours, wholly yours. Clean us, Lord. Make us pure. Make us bright and shining. Make us separate. Make us chosen of you to bear your name and your majesty for all to see. Your word tells us that we should practice good works that others may see your glory and glorify you. We pray that you would grant that for us. We as imperfect servants all have baggage. We pray that you would enable us to drop that baggage. And where we can get things right with other people, lead us to do that. That's the mark of true humility and repentance. Oh Lord, lead us to make these things right. That you would be pleased to use us. And that when we ask you for the souls of the lost, you would be pleased to respond. Because of who you are, Lord Jesus. Because of your great majesty, we think of that and we pray. Amen. If you could stand, we're going to sing one last song. things he has done. If you are ready to quit messing around and give your life to Christ, I want to talk with you after the service. If you need prayer to overcome an obstacle or something that's holding you back in your walk with the Lord, I'm happy to pray with you. But go with God's blessing and have a great day. Amen. <laughs>